Amen. Take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 21, please. Matthew chapter 21. We've been studying the parables on Wednesday night, and we'll continue to do that. I meant to mention in our prayer time, Linda Brown called the church. She's having surgery tomorrow at Long Beach Memorial and wants us to pray for her. So let's pray for Linda Brown tomorrow. She's having surgery there. I know she'll appreciate that. Matthew chapter 21. We'll stand in just a moment and read our text. And before we stand and do, I did want to make one other announcement to you. On, uh, I think it was Sunday morning, I made reference to uh, uh, a man named, uh, in an illustration named Tony, Tony Campolo. He's kind of a neo-evangelical type preacher. And I had a couple, couple folks ask me about him. And I just want to make, make you know, aware of, if I quote somebody or use somebody in illustration, that doesn't necessarily mean I'm putting a full endorsement on their ministry or everything that they believe or they say. I just found that that quote at that time for that point uh, was significant to what we were trying to make. And so well, I want you to understand that, that there's a lot of people who believe a lot of different things. We can't endorse everybody's everything, but uh, be, be aware of that. Let's stand together and we'll read in chapter 21, beginning in verse 33, as we continue the study of these parables. This parable kind of goes hand in hand with uh, the parable that we looked at last week. The last week we looked at the parable where a man had two sons. He came to one and told him to uh, go and work in the vineyard. And the one said, no, I won't do it. And then he went and worked. The other one said, sure, I'll go do it. But he never did. And Jesus was establishing his authority. We're going to build on the next parable, beginning in verse 33. Jesus says, here another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen, and went into a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen, that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandmen took his servants and beat one, and killed another, and stoned another. Again he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. But last of all he sent unto them his son, saying they will Reverence my son. When the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him, and cast him out of the vineyard, and slew him. When the Lord therefore of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? They say unto him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men, and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons." Jesus saith unto them, Did ye never read in the Scriptures? That's a good question to ask these guys. <laughs> Did not you read the Bible? The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I unto you, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you, and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall it will grind him to powder. And when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard his parables, I love this. If you mark things in your Bible, I marked this because it just kind of makes me laugh. They perceived that he spake of them. You know, how observant these guys were, right? But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet. That last verse seems to suggest very plainly that they were men pleasers, not God pleasers. Uh, but uh, quite a bit uh, uh, to say in this parable, and we'll try and break it down and give you something tonight. Heavenly Father, I do pray that you'd help me as I preach, fill me with thy spirit. I do pray that we would have ears to hear, and we'd be attentive listeners, and I just pray that you would work in our midst and help us to, to just really benefit from, from the word tonight. And it's in your name I pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, I was uh, thinking as I read this parable this afternoon and preparing for this, uh, I just couldn't help but think when we moved here to California, I think I, I told this story recently, but I want to tell it again. Uh, we, we were just really, I guess anxious is the right word about finding a place to live. And so I had come out here by myself and was kind of scoping around trying to find a place to live. And Brother David Palmer was helping us and we found a, a house and we thought that the guy was going to rent it to us. But then he began to think about the fact that I have five kids, and he started uh, backing out. He wouldn't even, 
He wouldn't even answer my calls anymore. He just, I mean, I guess that was his way of saying no by just not saying anything. And so then when we drove out here, we drove 20, over 2,600 miles, and the whole way we didn't know where we were going to live. And so the night we got here on a Thursday night, I had an appointment with a guy who thought he would maybe, maybe rent us a house on Friday morning. And I just remember thinking he wanted to meet us. He wanted to meet my family. He wanted to meet my, my children. And I just remember on the ride over there uh, to the house, I remember telling my kids, you all better behave yourself. That man looks at you, you better look at him in the eyeballs, you better speak, you better say yes sir, no sir. Uh, you better not be goofing around, you better not be fighting, you better not be yelling, you better not be running. Unless you want to live in a cardboard box, you'll behave, you know. And we were just really, you know, if you want to live, live under a bridge somewhere, you know, we were just really giving them the business. And, and, and I can imagine that what was going through their head as they were processing this is, yeah, I would imagine they've probably had some tenants somewhere uh, that maybe had a a multitude of children, and uh, they just really did a number on the house. And I can imagine that somebody that owns a piece of property or owns an apartment building or a rental house or owns some real estate like that has probably had some tenants that, uh, that were pretty destructive to their, their property. Maybe they're like the guy that I, I uh, read about today. He was complaining about the people upstairs of his apartment. They would they would just stomp on the ground and they would yell and they would stomp on the ground and yell uh, eat way past midnight. And he was telling his landlord about that and he said, well, does that keep you from sleeping? He said, no, but it interrupts my trumpet playing. <laughs> and, and I imagine when you, when you own some places and you, 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 you know, when you, you have tenants, I'm sure you have some very, very interesting stories because bad tenants would be a dime a dozen. And that's kind of what this parable is about, is some bad tenants. Uh, this parable, of course, we already mentioned before we read, is a continuation of verses 28 through 32. And Jesus began in that discussion, they began to question his authority. You see, Jesus has cleansed the temple. He cast out the, the filthy money exchangers, not because they were selling items, but they were uh, being extortioners and dishonest in the temple and uh, they were turning God's house into something that it shouldn't be. You know, it's a place of worship. It's a place of prayer. It's a, a place uh, that uh, uh, God should be glorified and honored and not uh, uh, defiled. And so uh, this is a very, very important thing that he cleansed the, the temple. And they began to question him, by what authority do you do that? And remember, he posed it back with a question. He said, well, let me ask you a question about John the Baptist. Was he of God or was he of men? And they said, well, we can't tell. They took a politically correct approach. And he said, well, then I'm not going to answer you. But I will answer you with a parable. And he begins a series of parables establishing his authority and setting himself up and, and, and giving an example of who he is. And so in this second parable, he gives an interpretation of the parable. And it's, it's a rather, uh, some of the parables might be difficult, but this is a rather easy one to interpret. You're going to find in this that the, the vineyard is Israel. Uh, oftentimes in the Bible, Jesus, or excuse me, God likens the nation of Israel to a vineyard. Uh, he, he does this specifically in Isaiah, that uh, Israel is like a vineyard that is expected to produce fruit. The tenants would be the religious leaders of the nation. You know, God gave the, 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 the people of Israel were the chosen people, but what were they chosen for? They were chosen for a purpose, for a task. That task was to be a priesthood interceding for the people and representing God to the people. They were to be a, a light to the world, not just to the Jewish nation, but to, to uh, uh, all of the Gentile world. And, and, and they were the tenants. They, they were taking care of something that wasn't, that wasn't theirs, but they were managing it on behalf of God. They were spiritual leaders. These messengers that would come on behalf of the husbandmen, those are obviously the various prophets that God would send. Uh, men like Jeremiah and Isaiah and Ezekiel and Micah and, and on down the line. These men that would come and speak on behalf of God. And clearly, according to the Bible here, the son was Jesus himself. A very simple parable. And I, again, that's why I love in verse 45, they perceived that he spake of them. Well, he sure was speaking about them and dealing directly to them. 
Now what I find interesting too is when he comes to the end of this story, he says that these messengers came and said, we want fruit, we want fruit, and, and they beat them up, and some of them they even killed, and then they, the, the husbandman says, I'll send my, uh, the, the landlord says, I'll send my son, and they, they killed him. Uh, you'll find he says in verse 40, when the Lord therefore the vineyard cometh, what will he do to those husbandmen? What, what do you think he will do? And it seems as in verse 41, this story is so gripping and it's so real that the Pharisees are, are, are like listening to Jesus tell this story that they become engrossed in it. it. A lot of these parables in this section kind of remind me of Nathan the prophet. We made reference to this last Wednesday. Nathan the prophet when he, he exposed David's sin. You remember David gets so angry that this this rich man would steal this poor man's sheep that he, he, he gets enraged. And I kind of see that in the Pharisees here. He says, well, what do you think that these, what do you think that this husband, or the, the owner of the vineyard is going to do to these husbandmen when he comes back that they killed his son? And I, you, you see there that in verse 41, he says, they say to him, he will miserably destroy those wicked men. It, it, it's like a, a little kid listening to a story and they hang on every single word. A, a, and then when he, that question is asked, they're so engrossed in the story that they respond in this way. And then you look at them, they kind of lean back after they get the question right. Remember in the first parable, he says there's two sons. He says, the one son, he says, uh, no, I won't go, but then he does go. And then the second son says, yes, I'll go, but then he doesn't go. And then he asks the question, which one do you think was obedient? And they said, well, the, the one that actually went. And then he says, what do you think he'll do? Uh, they killed his son. Well, they'll destroy, the, he'll wickedly destroy those wicked people. And he says, you're right. And I can kind of see them. They kind of lean back and they're kind of proud of themselves that they got the questions right. It's kind of like a, an animal that you set up for a trap. At, at our house, uh, we've had gopher problems. Any of you ever had a gopher in your... Man, they're miserable little creatures, aren't they? I mean, they're, they're difficult to get rid of. Uh, so what we did is uh, uh, we uh, got some uh, poison and we tried to put it down in their hole. That does not work. Then we bought this little sonar thing that's solar powered and we stuck it in there. That does not work. Then I took a hose and I stuck it down in his hole and I turned it on full blast. And I, set, I, I told my wife and set a timer, but she didn't hear it. And it kept going for a long, long time. Don't tell the government. That does not work. Then I took a a, a pool hose and I duct taped it to the tailpipe of my Suburban and I stuck the other end down and tried to gas him out. That does not work. Then I saw him sticking his head out one morning and I got a gun. And I walked out and I was creeping up and I was going to, you said you were going to do that in California? Yes I was. I hate gophers. But right when I drew a bead and was inching a little bit closer and ready to take a shot, Macy made a noise and, Ma and Mark went, Macy, be quiet, he's trying to kill a gopher. And he ducked back down so I didn't get a shot off. So we went and we found these really basic traps. You, you spring load the trap and you find their little hole and you, you kind of put it in the path of their tunnel and it's got two grips like this. And that little booger will want to go and he'll want to plug back up his hole because he doesn't want a snake to get down there and get him. Because I thought about buying a poisonous snake to eat him. But nevertheless, you can get these things and he, he, came, he comes over. And, and let me tell you, if you have gopher problems, these things work. Boom! We have to date killed three gophers. We have a picture of that? Yeah, there's... That's gopher number two right there. That's, that's, that's number two. Uh, the, the, the third one was kind of puny. This guy was pretty good size, and so that's my proud hunter's son there. He's uh, caught him a gopher. Well, I think this unsuspecting little gopher, you know, he's just, he's just burrowing through his little tunnel system that he's made in your yard. He's, he's nibbling at your, your flower roots and your tree roots, and he's having the time of his life. And he just walks across this unsuspecting trap, and he doesn't know any better. And the next thing you know, and I don't want any, any members of PETA in here, anybody? Okay, I, 
Those little springs, I mean, they just get him right in the neck and kill him and his little nasty yellow teeth are hanging out and dirt all in his clothes. You say, don't you feel bad for him? Not at all. Not at all. He should go into a kinder, gentler yard if he, if he wants that. Not, not in the Jones house. I mean, you saw how happy Mark was catching that filthy rodent. But these poor Pharisees, I mean, they're, they're so proud of themselves. Uh, they, oh, we got, what kind of questions are these? I mean, aren't you going to give us some hard questions, some difficult tests? They were walking right into Jesus' trap. He was exposing their sin. He was dealing directly with them. And tonight I want to give you three truths revealed in this parable. Number one, God's special provision is revealed in this parable. In New Testament times, this imagery that he gave, remember a parable is an earthly story that has a spiritual significance, and, and they would have easily related to what Jesus was saying. In New Testament times, the hillsides were covered with vineyards. It'd be like driving up north in California through uh, some of the vineyard-covered areas. You would, you would see them everywhere. And what would happen is a wealthy proprietor, he would buy a, a section of land, and what he would do, according to what Jesus said, it fits with culture and society, they would, they would first of all build a wall. They would either build a, a stone wall, or they would build some shrubs and some bushes and some thorns, and they would kind of hedge in and out a, a, an area. Then they would make a wine press. They would do this out of natural stone, or they would build it somehow. And, and, and as I was studying it, I couldn't help but think of the I Love Lucy uh, thing where she's in there stomping on grapes and, 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 and they would have this large tub where they would stomp on the grapes and they would mush them and then it would funnel down into another compartment and that's where they would bottle these, this grape juice and these wine presses and then they would build a they would build a tower, and in this tower it would be a place of storage or a place of lookout, a place of shade provided for its workers. And then what they would do is they would, once things got going, they would rent it and lease it to other husbandmen. And so what they would do is they would say, okay, you're, you're not wealthy enough to purchase the land, but I have done that. But what I'll do is I'll give you the land to cultivate. And basically what they would do is they would give the, the owner a cut of the fruit. Give him a cut of the wine. Give him a cut of the profit. And so that's why in this parable, the, the owner is constantly sending back messengers and people saying, I, I want my fruit. I, I expect my, my cut of what is going on. It was very reasonable and very uh, understandable that they, would, that they would do that, that they would send somebody uh, to go and get uh, their portion of the money. And, and you understand that this imagery I mentioned to you is very common language when it comes to Israel. If you were to go back, and we're not going to do it tonight for sake of time, but if you were to go back to Isaiah chapter 5, you'll find that God specifically, he does it in many, many other places in the Bible, but in Isaiah 5, very, very specifically, he refers to Israel as a vineyard. And basically what he is saying here is he's saying that God had given them a wonderful vineyard to cultivate. You talk about purchasing and setting off a, a, a great location. Remember, he gave Abraham a, what we call the promised land. And, and this promised land was a, was a, a nice uh, set of land. It, it, in fact, they're still fighting over it today if you haven't read the paper in a while. Uh, but it's a great location because you think about what God was doing. Remember, the, the nation of Israel, it, don't, don't get tripped up in the Bible when you read if you ever get uh, confused about chosen. When, when you look at chosen in the Bible, it's always chosen to do something. And he chose Israel to be a, a, a mouthpiece, a, a representative uh, uh, for him in the world and a line from which the Messiah would come. And, and it's by no accident that he put Abraham in Canaan land because that little sliver, you think, uh, my kids I think asked me the other day, why do Muslims hate uh, America so much? Why does the rest of the world hate so much, such? I think a lot of it has been historically, and that's what's very concerning about me to, uh, about things today is historically we've sided with Israel. And we helped them establish, reestablish the land from which they came from. And why are they fighting over this tiny little sliver of land? When you think about it, God put it in a strategic place. It, it, we call it the Middle East, but especially there. It's a bridge. It's a link between the three largest continents in the world and the three existing continents at that time. Europe, Asia, and Africa. Boom! Right there in the center of it. 
Not only was it a, a, a centrally located place, it was also a great, a, a very productive place with rivers and fertile soil. Uh, remember what they called it? It is a land flowing with milk and honey. And, and, and so it's a very productive place. And, and, and you'll see in this parable that he gave them great equipment. There's the tower and there's the wall and there's the wine press. And you'll see all of that reiterated in Isaiah chapter 5. And it's as if God is saying, there is, there is no reason whatsoever that Israel should not have borne fruit for my glory. And I think that if we want to apply that to our life, because we might be sitting here saying, well, I'm not Israel. I'm not, uh, that, what does that have to do with me? Oh, it has a lot to do with us because I think God could say this to all of us, that he has provided us with whatever is necessary to live for him. Can I tell you here tonight, uh, let me just be very, very plain. Uh, there is no excuse for anybody in this room whatsoever to not live for God. No one is going to have an excuse as, as to why we didn't live for God. Uh, so I might say, well, you know, growing up, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I mean, I didn't have a good example. Oh, do you have an example in the Bible? I don't know, maybe David and Daniel and Joseph and Paul. And say, well, they, had, they messed up a little bit. Hey, any example you're going to find in life is going to mess up a little bit. But there are great examples of what to do when you do mess up. There are great examples of what you should not do so you don't mess up. Hey, you can't say you don't have good examples. God has provided them for you. Well, I didn't have anybody teaching me anything. Well, if you're born again, you have the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you, and he is the great teacher. He's the one that wrote this book. And so while you might have a pastor, you might have somebody that can teach you, if you're saved, you do have the ultimate teacher, which is the Holy Spirit. You might say, well, I didn't have a support group. I need a support group. Hey, look around you. It's called the local church. It's the greatest support. Hey, the local church has been around before support groups came around. You know why? Because God, whatever you want to call it, but God knew you need a support group. And so he created the local church. I'm just simply saying, there, there is, we could go on down the line. There is no excuse for anybody in this room to not live for God. Even if you got off to a late start, even if you've had a difficult time in life, even if the deck is stacked against you, uh, so to speak, everybody in here ha has been equipped and provided for so that you can bear fruit for the glory of God. Now, I understand you'll see it in other parables that some people were expected to bear hundredfold, some sixtyfold, uh, some thirtyfold, some fivefold. Uh, hey, I understand God's going to be patient with people, but there is no excuse for us to not bear fruit for God's glory. And he looks at Israel because he's speaking to the Pharisees and he says to them, I expect fruit out of you. And that was reasonable. Remember what the Bible says in Romans? He says, present your bodies a living sacrifice, which is holy and acceptable. It's your reasonable service. That's not asking you to do something that is beyond reason. God is not asking you to do something that is ridiculous. God is not asking you to do something that you cannot do. He is, it, it's very reasonable when you look at what he has done for us that we produce fruit for his glory. So when there was no fruit, you know what he does? He sends reminders. He sends reminders their way, and you'll notice in our text that they were ignored. Now, I want to give you a crash course, because we don't have time completely tonight, but give you a crash course of some of the prophets. If, if you remember Jeremiah, remember they took Jeremiah and they threw him down in a pit? He's down there sinking in mud, and somebody had to go and put a long line of rags and pull him out of the mud, and eventually uh, Jeremiah was stoned to death. You think of it, and, and by the way, uh, that ought to, we, we ought to understand something. You know, Jeremiah we revere, and there's a great, great book in the Bible about him, but you, you got to understand, I mean, this was a man who preached for years, and he had, he had no results. I mean, he was just faithful preaching the Lord. We revere him as a hero, but I think sometimes today we get the cart before the horse and we think that all of our great heroes are these people that have these great results and great numbers. Jeremiah had none. You know what they did to his message? They scoffed him. They, they took him and threw him down into a, a, a pit where he's sinking in mud. They eventually stoned him to death. You think of Ezekiel. Ezekiel was rejected by God's people. He was rejected by Israel. Micah got smashed in the face. Zechariah was murdered in the temple. John the Baptist was beheaded. Stephen was stoned to death. I mean, it just goes along with exactly what this parable says, is I expected, I provided for you, and then I expected you to do something, and when I sent messengers not to condemn you, not to hurt you, but to remind you of what you're supposed to do, here's how you reacted towards them. Verse 36 you mark the things in your Bible, mark this. 
He says, again, he sent other servants. So even after they responded this way to three servants, they beat one, killed another, stoned another. And then in verse 36, it says, again, he sent other servants. And each step of their wickedness and their stubbornness was met with new mercies that were fresh every single morning. God just kept sending messenger after messenger, prophet after prophet to them, begging them, beseeching them, requesting them, commanding them, correcting them to bear fruit for him. And you say, well, was God just being insensitive to the suffering of his servants? No, it shows the heart of God. It shows how God longs for his people to repent. It shows how God longs for his people to do what they're supposed to do. He is so burdened about that. He's so uh, passionate about it that he would send, even though these people rejected message after message after message and messenger after messenger after messenger, God still called out to them. And then... After they rejected all of these prophets, what did he do? He sends his only begotten son. For God so loved the world that even though they rejected his prophets, I don't know about you, but I'd say three strikes and you're out, pal. But that's not the heart of God. You ever heard somebody say this? Well, the God of the Old Testament, he's so hard and harsh and judgmental. But the God of the New Testament, he's love and he's grace. I think you need to go back and read your Bible if you've thought that way, or you need to tell somebody that says that to go back and read their Bible because that's just not true. The God of the Old Testament is the same God of the New Testament. Nothing is further seen by why we would let, even though He's going to flood the earth for 120 years, Noah built that ark. For 120 years, Noah said, Hey, you need to repent. You need to repent. It's coming. It's, why did God wait 120 years? Because that's the heart of God. Messenger after messenger, prophet after prophet, uh, uh, time after time. And then if that wasn't enough, he sent his own son. God robed in the flesh. Uh, the word took on flesh and be became, we beheld his glory and, and he came to man. Why? Because it's the heart of God. He's always providing and reaching out to sinful man. In Isaiah 5.4, God asked this question. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? So the first thing we see in this parable, the first thing that's revealed, first lesson that's taught is that God gives special provision. Number two, man's stubborn rebe rebellion is revealed in this parable. Romans 2, 4 says this, or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance, that means tolerance, and long-suffering. Long-suffering is patience while you're being provoked, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth to repentance. Oh, God was so good to them. God was so kind to them. He's so tolerant of them. He's so forbearing. And by the way, I keep saying them, but we could easily say, God is so kind towards me. God is so tolerant and forbearing towards me. And even though I provoked him, God was long-suffering and patient with me. And after God had done all of this, what did they do? They stole his property. They rejected and abused his messengers. They denied his rightful claims. They, they killed his son. Why did they do this? Well, they do not simply believe. They simply do not want to believe. You ever notice that about a lot of people? That they, ah, I don't know if I can believe that. No, you don't want to believe that. Because God has given evidence after evidence and goodness after goodness, and it's our stubborn denial, our stubborn unbelief, our stubborn refusal that would keep us from coming from God. You see, they wanted Jesus dead. These men wanted Jesus dead, not because he was an ungodly character, but because he threatened their evil and ungodly control of the temple and the religious system that they had set up. He was a threat to their kingdom. He was a threat to their religious system. He was a threat to their control. And that's why they hated him. And you'll, you'll understand something. When we look into, at the Pharisees, it's very easy for us in church to look over and that word Pharisee becomes a very negative word to us. And we look at the Pharisees and we dislike them and we despise them. But we must understand that in many ways, the tendencies and the issues and the problems of the Pharisees can often be our issues and our problems and our tendencies. And, and our stubborn refusal at times to obey God, after God has been so good to us that the goodness of God should lead us to repentance, oftentimes we don't do that. 
We continue to take advantage of his provision and we continue to take advantage of his grace and take advantage of his mercy and, and we, we, we reject him. In fact, we react in many ways like these people did. You see, when conviction grips your heart and if you're saved and you come to church at all, you, you're going to get convicted. I mean, you've ever been in church? I mean, I've been in church before and you know, somebody, uh, you know, I've had people say, you must have been talking to my wife because everything you're preaching about today, uh, she must have been telling you all the wrong things I'm doing. <laughs> While I'm preaching, I've seen people elbow each other. I've had people say, you stepped on my toe. Whatever you want to say, you know, I always say if the phone's ringing, answer it. Or if, the, or if you're rubbing the cat the wrong way, turn the cat around. That, you know, that, that feeling, that intensity, that, that's just called conviction. And, and you've got two choices. I've been convicted by... Man, it's amazing how many times I've been in the middle of preaching and God has convicted me with my own words. I've sat in service after service after service and been convicted by the preaching. I've read my Bible and been convicted. When you are faced with conviction, you have one of two responses. The first is what you should do is you can repent. That, that's what I mean when I say if the shoe fits, wear it. If there's something that needs tweaking or changing or adjusting or fixing, Hey, if God's right, that's what repentance is. God is right, I'm wrong, I'm going to deal with that. So you can, number one, you can either repent, or number two, you can get mad at the messenger. And that happens a lot. That's what they did, is they, they got mad at men like Jeremiah, men like Ezekiel. They, they, we're getting ready to study on Sunday morning, uh, Daniel chapter 6. These men were so uh, envious and jealous of Daniel that they, 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 they couldn't find any blemish in his life, and so what they would do is they would trap him by his own religion. They just hated him. And that hasn't changed. You see, think about it. The husbandmen could not attack the owner, but they could attack the servants. And I'm just going to tell you, it, it's so true, and this is therapeutic for me at times, but anyone who dares to serve God is subject to attack. Now, if you just want to play it safe and coast it out, don't live for God and don't serve Him. If you want to be a little courageous and stick your neck out on the line a little bit, serve God. Because you'll, if you serve God and you step up to do what God wants you to do, hey, I'm telling you, you're going to, I'm not necessarily saying you'll be attacked. I'm saying you'll subject yourself to possible attack. You see, these men in this text, they were the son who said he wouldn't go, or said he would go but didn't. They were the vine growers who beat and killed messengers. They were the builders who rejected the cornerstone. And in verse 45, it says that they understood exactly what he was saying, but they never took it to heart. I wonder how many of us have, have been like this. The message wasn't confusing. The Word of God is plain as day. Maybe the preacher's message is as clear as crystal. It wasn't muddy. You knew exactly what it said. You even knew that it applied to your life. But you didn't take to heart what was said. If you've ever come into a church service, you've ever opened up your Bible and read that way, and you knew that the Holy Spirit of God was dealing with you and speaking to you and directing to you, but you just, yeah, okay, I perceive you're talking about me but you left the same way you came in, that's a revelation of the stubbornness and the pride and the willfulness of the common man's heart. Let me give you the third thought tonight. God's severe retribution is revealed in this parable. We saw that in verse 40. What will he do to those husbandmen? Now the answer is kind of in the form of a pun. I kind of learned a new word today. It's a... Uh, paranomasia, and the idea there is the repetition of words similar in sound but different in sense. And so what they were saying there is when they said, he will miserably destroy those wicked men, it's as if they were saying, he will miserably destroy those miserable men. He'll put those wretches to wretched death. They, they, were, they were making a pun on words and using it in a, in a double time. And, and, and even though they were sinful people that were rejecting God, they were right. Because we talked about God's provision, and we talked about how good God is, and how gracious God is, how forbearing and long-suffering, how compassionate He is. But let's not make the mistake to think that He's soft either. That He's some grandfatherly marshmallow 
that won't deal with those that oppose him. Because no one can refuse repeated offers of divine grace without experiencing severe judgment, ultimately. I want to read to you. You can mark it down and read it yourself later, but in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, and verse 8, the Bible says this, "...in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power." And there are a lot of people that want to deny hell. They want to say when you die, you're just, you're just like that gopher you saw a minute ago. I mean, you're just dead. You're just gone. I think the Bible's pretty clear when we've just read in 2 Thessalonians. God is no one to be trifled with. In fact, he says in verse 42, he kind of expounds a little bit. And, it, and it's almost as if, and I, I'm going to kind of blow through this, but it's almost as if this is irrelevant, but it's not. Nothing that Jesus said was ever irrelevant or or it, without connection to what, he was, what was going on. But he says, didn't you read in the Scriptures? And he begins to quote Psalm 118. What's interesting is earlier in this chapter, chapter 21 of Matthew, is where we have Jesus coming into Jerusalem. And you remember in Jerusalem that they, they took those branches and they began to cheer Him and, and shout to Him, Hosanna in the highest. Well, they also said, blessed is He that cometh in the name of the Lord. And that was, when they said that, that was a quotation from Psalm 118. And so Jesus is speaking here and he says, you, you heard him quoting Psalm 118. Uh, haven't you read the Bible? Don't you know what that whole Psalm says? And, and, and what he does is he uses the same passage that was used to acclaim him to accuse these men. He, said, he starts talking about this cornerstone. Well, what is a cornerstone? A cornerstone is the most basic or essential part of a building. It, it, it ensures uh, proper uh, symmetry, and, and therefore, because it gets it squared, it gives stability to a building. Now, I'm not a builder, I'm not an architect, but uh, we, we used to have a, I, our, our church used to own eight acres of land, and we would have what we call Old Fashioned Day, and we would... We'd put up several big tents, and we'd have preaching in the tents, just like in the old days, like old revival-type meetings, you know, and <clears throat> we would put these tents up, and our, our church bought a tent, and I think it was about, I think it was like 40 feet by 60 feet, so it was a pretty good-sized tent. And, you know, uh, sometimes uh, I might be a little this way, I was like, ah, you know, it's got poles, and it's got ropes, and you just stick it up there. I mean, you know, how hard can it be? Well, it's really not that hard to, like I said, to stick a pole in there and put it up and tie it down. What's hard is to get it to stay up. Because if you don't square it right, you don't have a pure rectangle. You have like a trapezoid or something. And it ain't going to stay up. And so I remember when we would go, we would get a big group of men to put this up, and we would have to really take some pains to get some ropes and some uh, uh, paint and markings and, and uh, angles and measurements because we wanted to true the corner. We had to make sure that it was at a proper right angle, and then we would go to the opposite side and get a proper right angle so that we could, we could true this, this tent because we wanted to be cornered right so that when we staked it down and tied it down and the wind would come, that it would be stable and sure. Because if, if it wasn't, it would come down in a heartbeat. You say, how do you know that? I've seen it happen. So they would get a cornerstone that would properly true the structure that they were building so it would give it symmetry and stability. Now you can understand, Jesus, when he refers to himself as the cornerstone, He's saying, I am the cornerstone of your faith. No other foundation can a man lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Do you want to be stable in your spiritual life? Then you better make sure that your building, your structure, your spiritual life is built on the cornerstone. You want to have balance and stability and structure in your spiritual life? then you better build on the cornerstone. Now, the Bible talks about the cornerstone that was rejected by the builders. 
Oftentimes, a cornerstone is very expensive in in, uh, ancient architecture, but many times they would bring the cornerstone, they would say, no, this one isn't right, and they would reject it, and they would sometimes have to reject many cornerstones before they got the right one. And Jesus is saying, haven't you read the Bible? The Bible says that there's a cornerstone, and I'm the cornerstone. And you can't reject the cornerstone and expect to build anything. He said, in fact, the cornerstone to you has become a stumbling block. He goes, and you might fall on the cornerstone and it hurt you, but it's better to fall on the cornerstone and be offended and hurt than have the cornerstone fall on you. I don't know if you've ever fell on a hard surface before and hurt yourself. I've done that before. Brother Doug's laughing right now because I think he knows the story I'm going to tell. I had a, you ever had a bad week? Yeah, I've had a bad week. I remember one week I, I grabbed the van. We had a van door with those sliding doors, and I grabbed the van, and I, pulled, I, would, I would reach inside it and pull it shut, but I didn't get my hand out in time. Oh, that really, really hurt. Like so bad you're, you're vomiting. Then, then I, uh, uh, later that week, I was up at the church, and I noticed Brother Doug was working late on a Saturday night, getting ready for a big day. We had this big patriotic day filled with decorations, and uh, he was up there working, and I dropped in. I was doing some things. I said, Brother Doug, what do you need help with, man? I want you to go home. And he said, well, could you make sure that some of the decorations are hung properly and straight in the foyer? I said, sure, I can do that. And so I head out, but I knew my way around the auditorium, so why bother turning on the lights? Because after all, I mean, there are lighted exit signs. You can see a little bit. And I know my way around an auditorium. I, I, I know it. And, but, but here's the problem is I don't walk slow, especially when I'm on a mission. And so I came through the side doors of the auditorium, and it's dark, and a little bit of light coming through the windows, and you got the exit lights in the back. And I, I came, and I was walking really fast around, and I could, see the, I could see the aisle, and I could see the exit sign. But what I did is our, our pews were tapered, and so the shorter pew, and then the next pew was a little longer, and the next pew was a little longer. And when I came around really fast around the corner, my, my right thigh clipped the, clipped the edge of the, of the pew, caused me to fall, and since it was so dark, I had zero depth perception. And with those tapered pews, the, the armrest is sticking out, and we had solid oak pews. And so when I began to fall, I couldn't see where I was going. I figured I'd be, but my face, no arm out, no, nothing to brace it, nothing but my face hit that solid wood, I mean, square. I do not know how it didn't knock my teeth out. I mean, it was like I didn't even know what hit me. Boom! I'm laying on the ground seeing stars. I mean, I, I, I'm feeling if my teeth are there. I think I bit through my lip. Man, I got, I, I got up and staggered out. I'm like half concussed. I, I'm feeling like fleshy parts of my lips that I shouldn't feel. I, I, I hung the flag up and I walk into the I walked into Brother Doug's office, my dear friend. We've served the Lord faithfully together for over a decade. I said, I think I'm going to kill myself. My lips hanging out, blood's running on my face. And he, he, he begins to laugh, and he goes, are you okay? <laughs> Listen, I know what it's like to fall on a hard, sub, uh, a hard surface and hurt yourself. And I imagine you do too. But you know, I'd, I'd rather fall on that pew than have that pew fall on me. Because he said to them, hey, you, you could fall on it and be hurt, but I'm telling you, if it falls on you, you're going to be ground into powder. You think about this, a broken man can heal. Oh, well, my face hurt. It hurt a lot. And I went home and my, my sy sympathetic friend I went home and met my equally sympathetic wife, who is always stating the Captain Obvious. Well, why didn't you turn the lights on? Are you okay? And I'm laying on the couch. <gasps> I gotta preach in the morning. My lips like three times the size as it normally is. Listen, I'll tell you, I eventually healed. 
And I want to tell you, sometimes maybe the gospel message might be offensive to someone. For them, it was very offensive to them. Uh, they, they were tripping all over his message. I want to tell you, he was warning them. You might trip over the message, but don't let the message land on you. Because as loving and as gracious and as good and as wonderful as Jesus is, when he comes again, his eyes are as a flaming vengeance. You don't want that to fall on you. I'm thankful God's not finished with Israel. We learned that from Romans 11. But I will tell you this, and we'll apply it and get out of here. If God was compelled to change tenants once, and I'm talking about, Jerusalem, uh, about Israel, and now he's using the church. They're two different entities, but he's using the church for his purposes today. And he will come back to Israel according to Romans 11. But if God was willing to change tenants once, don't you think he'd be willing to do it again? You say, well, how are you going to apply that to us? Because I think there are a lot of churches that live in the good old days. They live in the, the way it was and this and that. And instead of pursuing and obeying God today, I don't want God to write over my life, Ichabod, the glory has departed. No, no. I want God. I want to build my life on the cornerstone. Build my spirituality on something stable and something sure. May God help us with that. I got three questions for you and I'm done tonight. Question number one. Do you realize how much you've been blessed with God's provision? I think Israel had forgotten how much God had blessed them. What God had given them. What God had equipped them with. We should never lose sight of how God has blessed us. And sometimes we do. Question number two. In what ways are you stubbornly refusing God's grace in your life? Stubbornly refusing to obey. Stubbornly refusing to get with it. Question number three. When he comes, because I believe he's coming again, when he comes, how's he going to deal with you? Is it going to be a joyous return? Or is it going to be a fearful return? Because I don't want the stone to fall on me. So aren't you saved? Yeah, I am saved. But I also, I also want to live my life for him. So that there's fruit to be found in my life when he comes rightfully expecting it.